I have family full of genetic problems health wise with um, a brother who died from cancer after esophageal cancer was, uh, after having gut problems, he refused to take any medicine, thought it might cause liver damage. My gastroenterologist said, you'd better take it. You'll end up dead before liver problems if you don't. Now I'm on three medications for my gut. But four brothers, all four have acid reflux and gut problems. Three sisters, not sure if they have any. I have big time. I've had two surgeries. And my mother, all of us, with acid reflux and beyond. Is that possibly genetic as well as any other things you've discussed? So we do, so we do know that genetics plays a role in about 3% of disease, okay? I'm not familiar with the genetics of having like GERD run in the family, but what GERD runs into is America, right? That's why we have those proton pump inhibitors and acid blockers that are just literally you go to the store and you'll see like from floor to ceiling and, you know, especially the big box stores. So here's like three month supply box of that. And people just, you know, you just order auto ship and it delivers now. Um, the thing is, you know, those drugs used to only be given for a short period of time. In fact, those drugs were only for um, prescriptions. Right. There's only like you had to see a doctor and they had to follow it. And then once they lose their patent and they can't charge as much, then they go directly to the market. And now it's like anybody can take it without actually following. Um, does it help in certain indications in the beginning for ulcers and those kind of things? And, and people are having like erosions of the esophagus, severe reflux and damage when they do the scopes. Yes, it can definitely help. But none of those things are still looking at, well, what is causing the triggers of me having heartburn to begin with? There could be some genetics that are playing a role, but genetics are what we have to understand is, is your epigenetics is more important. But epigenetics is your diet, lifestyle, and your environment belief system is what makes your genetics express. So we all are kind of delivered cards, right? And it's how you play the game. I always tell people like that. Um, so it's not just like, oh my God, I'm doomed and gloom because we mean the same thing with heart disease, same thing with diabetes. People say, well, diabetes runs in my family. My great, great grandfather had diabetes. Everybody has diabetes in my family. So they went out and they ate whatever they wanted because they had diabetes or you know, I have heart disease or you know, everybody's a heart disease person. So they had a heart attack, but we understand is that there's tendencies that you might put you at higher risk, but it's the epigenetics is how you actually change your RNA and DNA, but in real time, and that's through diet, lifestyle, environment, belief system. So our goal, if we, you know, if we were to work with you and all is be looking at, well, what are the, what are the diet, lifestyle, environmental triggers that are coming in? Just some of that, what's in this lecture, some of that I'll talk about also on Thursday, but what are the triggers that are coming in that are causing this inflammatory response? And it might be the same that's happening throughout the whole family, but your specific individual triggers that will be yours. You you might still have the same symptoms as the rest of the family members, but also just as the rest of most of America, not even understanding that, you know, it may not necessarily be as much of a genetic issue. There's some tendencies to be higher, but it doesn't mean that you have to follow that genetic expression the same as your family. Thanks very, very much for that, Dr. Pai. And uh, we're going to bring on Michelle next. Michelle, you are unmuted. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. Um, I'm very interested in what you were sharing about uh, biofilm. And I'm curious if biofilm has uh, resulted from, you know, prolonged exposure to these micro unbeneficial microbes. Can, can that be reversed simply through sustaining a very healthy whole food plant based diet? Um, and, you know, staging those foods back into the diet without having to do any type of a candida protocol or an, anything like that. Can, can you make the gut healthy enough through diet and lifestyle without doing those harsher intervention with herbs? Well, that, that's actually a great question. Um, and we see that partially. Uh, and the reason being is because some things have been super chronic, right? So if something's just relatively new, Someone's like, yeah, just the last couple months, then the diet can relatively fix that, you know, but if something's like it's been happening, you know, for a decade or more, then we know that there's going to be a, a harder challenge. Now, does their symptoms improve just with diet alone? Yes. Usually, you know, when people go to a plant-based diet, the data will say when our clinical experience actually matches the data, about 80, 85% of most conditions just get better. Right. But when we have this biofilm issue is that if it's a chronicity of issues, then we have to look at, can we give something to help disrupt that? Otherwise, they're like, I've treated, I treated, or I'm eating a spectacular diet. I mean, you can't ask some of these people to do more than what they're doing. I mean, they actually go further and beyond what I would expect them because like, wow, they're really hardcore. They're really you know, crushing it, being trying to, you know, be perfect and not have any kind of extraneous aspects. The problem is still, though, is that if there is biofilms, it is a little bit more difficult. And so 
I always like to look at when we get people to like uh, either take a natural therapy or, you know, we're changing, we have to get about 80% to that. This, we call it the 80% threshold. A lot of the doctors in GI uh, who treat SIBO and all, we talk about this 80% threshold. If you get to 80% improvement of your symptoms, the diet will take over. It doesn't have to be hundred percent. And in fact, it's, it's foolish for people to think like, I'm going to take a treatment. It's going to be hundred percent. Nothing's hundred percent prescription or natural. Not, nothing's hundred percent. But you want to do is you want to get to that point where like, you know, when you're, when people are about 50%, it's still like a teeter totter. It can swing the other way. Now, some people like can get 50% and their diet is great. And then boom, you know, but if their diet has been great for a long period of time and they're still having symptoms, then it looks like we still have to caught that there might be some chronicity of the biofilm being there and, the, and, and disrupting it. Otherwise it's like, they're not, they're not getting that full benefit and there's no fault of their own. It's like, it's like you can't eat better food or, 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 or more anti-inflammatory food. If you're already doing it, the idea is that that's just more of a physiological thing. Thing that's becoming a chronic problem. Thanks very, very much for that, Dr. Pai. And uh, now we're going to move to Curtis. I'm going to unmute you. Welcome, Curtis. Hi, uh, can you hear me well? Yes, I can. Very good. Uh, hey, uh, I'm, I'm uh, from uh, talking from just outside of Minneapolis. Um, so I've dealt with uh, chronic fatigue. My daughter has Hashimoto's. So we've been down the whole um, functional medicine tour. Um, it was helpful somewhat. Um, I'm very interested moving forward, how we can, um, improve physician training, education and training. Um, cause it sounds, you know, cause you were, you just had mentioned, you know, you know, the, the MDs have access to certain kinds of tests that these, you know, that a, a straight Cairo or some other kind of, or a health coach functional person wouldn't have access to. And so what would you consider to be um, like, you know, an ideal blend of, um, of, of education and training to, for physicians who are going to be dealing with, with pans, you know, kids sure. and sure. all of these, um, in all of these kinds of gut, you know, of these lifestyle related environmental, you know, cause, cause we live in a, in the United uh, yeah, States. You're absolutely correct. I hate to interrupt, but yeah, we live in this world where it's not, you know, it's not just the diet, although it's a huge contributing factor, but now we have environmental exposures, right? That, that we didn't sign up for. We have exposure where you live, depends on where you work, depends on you know, your house, depends on the water that you drink. You know, I'll talk to some of that on Thursday's lecture as well. But the, the issue is what, what I have, and this is my personal kind of vice, I think, is that too many people have access to just get labs. And, and, and the problem is right now, because like, lab companies don't care, right? Lab companies are make money on the labs. Like in our practice, we don't upcharge on any of the labs. And right now in functional medicine and some of this kind of holistic uh, expansion of this, and everybody's trying to be like some kind of functional medicine practitioner. When I did my training, it was 20, 22 years ago with functional medicine. I was like, before they even had, like, that was like one of the first people in the Institute of Functional Medicine. Now they're like, there's so many different certificates and grades of certificates and what kind of degree you might have. So everybody thinks I'm a functional medicine practitioner, not even being a healthcare provider, they can still get a functional medicine practitioner. The problem with that in my opinion, is, is that they don't have the background physiology, anatomy, immunology, pharmacology, uh, and nutrition. Now, a lot of doctors, rightfully so, unfortunately, they don't have the nutrition part of it as well. And it takes, it takes a, a unique type of person to say, okay, I need to start filling in all these gaps. The problem is, I think they're addressing, you know, a lot of people are just ordering tests because that's a revenue producing thing in their practice. Like, hey, you can do all these tests. And I have all these patients again, they said, I spend $10,000 on all these tests, but no one tells, and literally I get like four patients a week. They're like, here's a stack of things, but no one can then tell me what this means. And I'm like, well, then they shouldn't be ordering the test. The problem is now that all these lab companies don't care who's ordering the test, as long as they have some kind of certificate, then it causes patients really a lot of stress because, you know, there's a cost to those tests, unfortunately. It's usually not covered by insurance uh, and, or they have some kind of out-of-pocket pay. But the thing is, it's very, it, it's very important information to actually help use. Like, I don't want to throw away information that someone has. Like, you just have to understand how to interpret it. But there is a lack. Now, also on the flip side, uh, a lot of the MDs who may have access don't have the training of that, right? Because they're just conventional. So like the GI doctors who should know the most about this, there's a few. Uh, not in this country, there's a few in other countries I've seen before, who are fantastic. They're like, wow, they're so ahead of their field. And it's just because we're kind of still practicing, you know, a lot of doctors are practicing on symptomatic treatment rather than kind of going to the disease prevention and intervention and of looking at what are the triggers and kind of going at the root cause of disease and more importantly, the, the dis-ease that people have. And so it's a tough thing. I think what we have to do is we have to have this idea of like, 
understanding what a true integrative medicine physician is. A lot of people now throw this word around. You know, I, I'm fellowship. I was in one of the first classes 22 years ago, right? So that was before they even understood what the word was. And people are like, oh, what are you doing? And now everybody's trying to grab holistic and integrative and, you know, lifestyle. Everybody's trying to grab some kind of certificate now of training, but they're not actually going through a full fellowship. They're just like, oh, I just went to a weekend course and I got this so-called certificate. Or a lot of people now just use it on the internet, uh, on social media, and they're not even even did a class or, or even fully trained. So it is a problem. I think it's going to take several years because I think there's a lot of collateral damage where patients are now kind of going from right to left. Like they go to conservative doc, they don't know what they're talking about, uh, meaning they don't address these things. They, they're good at what they look at, but they're not looking at it from a functional or integrated perspective. And then they go to the naturopath or chiropractors or some of these other docs or practitioners uh, with some kind of certificate. And then they're not getting also the integration of like, well, how does this medication or how like the lady, like, how does this genetics work? Or how does this other part of my disease affect this? And they're like, I can't tell you that because I'm not trained in that. Or they will try to tell you that and that's wrong because they don't have the training to do so. So uh, I don't really have a good answer for you, but I uh, hopefully over time, there will be more people like me and more kind of training programs that will be looking at. I just look at really look at the quality of the training of the provider. You know, it, it, I'm kind of old school and letting you know, like everybody I look at who's like 20 years younger than you have a fancy website, they have great social media presence, but their educational experience is pretty much nil or lacking. And you probably experienced that. It sounds good. You like this, this is what I, they're speaking my language. I, they, they're, they're onto the pans or they're onto the environmental toxicity or they're onto the, you know, the, the autoimmune condition. But when it actually comes to like, what do we offer you? And then what are the, what are the things they don't have the evidence-based understanding of the experience of practicing medicine. And that's the challenge, right? Uh, and so we, we, we will hopefully over time we can expand that um, and have better trained physicians and practitioners and actually have a, you know, I, I work with, the, you know, even though I do a lot of things myself, I, like when I, when there's something that's out of my lane, then I'm like, you need to go see this person for that. You need, I mean, like the, the, the best kind of practitioner is knowing, you know, where, where you stand. And so I know exactly what I'm really good at and I will pride myself on being the best at and things that I'm slightly off. I'm like, well, that's not my area of expertise. Then I'll say like, well, maybe there's someone else. And then hopefully I can help also get, if they say, well, what about this practitioner? Then I can kind of sort of look at them and kind of vet them on some level saying, yeah, they probably will be helpful or, you know, stay far away from them. They're just going to steer you wrong. Thank you.